Good morning. The first item of business is general questions, and at question number one, I call Pauline McNeill. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made towards reaching a resolution to the ongoing dispute with the Fire Brigade Union. Minister Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me be clear that the Scottish Government is not in dispute with the FBU. The FBU campaigns on behalf of its members, as all trade unions do, and we share the aim of having an effective and fire and rescue service to keep our communities safe. I meet regularly with the FBU and I'm next scheduled to meet them with them this month. Holly McNeill. Regional Secretary of the Fire Brigade Union, John McKenzie, is on record as saying the union are in consultation with their members around industrial action, but it's extremely important to note that this action is as a result of the deep impact of cuts on the safe running of the fire and rescue service and firefighters are considering taking this unprecedented action because they are firmly of the view that lives are being put at risk. With that in mind, what is the Scottish Government going to do to avert strike action and ensure safer communities? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The £36 million savings figure for 26-27 quoted by the SFRS Chief Officer is based on various assumptions of inflation, pay increases and future funding levels which can all change over time. The RSR provides long-term indicative spending plans for the Scottish Government based on the challenging financial uh, situation we currently find ourselves in. While it is appropriate for the SFRS to assess its long-term planning up to 26-27 on that basis, it does not replace the annual budget presented to Parliament. The actual am amount allocated to SFRS in the annual budget will be based on a robust assessment of need, as was the case for 23-24 when we gave them an extra £14.4 million. Pounds. Sharon Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Our fire service is in crisis, according to the Fire Brigade Union. This ongoing dispute, if unresolved, threatens to have a further detrimental impact in response times in rural communities in my area. Minister, why is it that rural communities should suffer due to the SNP Government's failure to resolve long-standing issues within Scotland's Fire and Rescue Service? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Since 2017 to 18, there has been a substantial year-on-year -year increases in funding to support SFRS to create a modern and effective fire and rescue service. The equivalent annual budget for SFRS for 23 to 24 is over £55.3 million higher than it was in 2017 to 2018. And I'd just like to highlight to the member, during the First Minister's questions on the 26th of October, the First Minister made clear and I quote, we continue to invest in our fire service. I want to thank and pay tribute to the FBU and our firefighters on the ground. I will continue to promise them that we will, as long as we are in government, continue to ensure that they will get the investment that they need to keep the community safe. Question number two, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Fire Brigade Union report, Firestorm, which reportedly warns that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service is in crisis. Minister Siobhan Brown. Thank you. I recognise the role that the Fire Brigade Union plays in highlighting the concerns of its members, including in the publication of their Firestorm report. There are many po po points in the Firestorm report uh, that I agree with, including that our firefighters should be paid a fair wage for their work that they do and should be properly trained and equipped to deal with the wide range of emergency incidents that they attend. And as I said in my previous answer, we're providing Scottish Fire right Rescue with more than £368 million this year, which is an increase of £14.4 million on last year. And this Scottish Government will continue to support SFRS to prioritise public safety. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Minister for that answer. On Tuesday, the Fire uh, Brigade uh, indicated in their publication showed new statistics uh, showing a rise in fatal fire incidents and an increase in non-fatal fire casualties, uh, amounting to just under 1,000 in one year. The data illustrates the dangerous consequences of an underfunded fire brigade. Therefore, can the minister uh, tell me how worse will it need to get before this government looks at statistics and provides the information that is required to support the fire service that they deserve? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Fatal fire casualties per million per population have been in a long-term downward trend in each nation since the early 2000s. This trend levelled off in, in each nation around early 2010. 
2010, but differing demographics, deprivation and urban rural profiles of each nation are the likely factors in explaining the different rates of fires. But we as the Scottish <coughs> Government will continue to work with the FBU and SFRS to ensure that they have the money that they need to keep the community safe. Colin Beattie. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service is highly valued for its unwavering dedication to saving lives and protecting communities, embodying the highest levels of service and public safety. Within the Firestorm report, 96% of respondents agreed that increased investment in training and facilities would positively impact the skills and preparedness of firefighters. With consideration to the concerns raised about training, will the Minister consider the recommendation in the report for an independent audit of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service training provisions? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Ensuring our firefighters are properly trained and equipped is a ministerial priority within the Scottish Fire Rescue Framework 2022. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service has a dedicated Assistant Chief Officer with responsibility for training to ensure this strategic priority is properly addressed. Some aspects of training fell behind as a result of the COVID restrictions, but the service is addressing that backlog as a priority. His Majesty's Fire Service Inspectorate in Scotland carries out independent inspection of fire service activity and training is already examined as part of the HF, HMFSI Service Delivery Area Inspection Programme. The East Service Delivery Area Inspe Inspection Report was published on the 19th of October and the service will be taken forward all the recommendations contained in the report. Katie Clark. Minister, agree with me that the Firestorm report makes alarming reading and that the failure to provide safe systems to enable firefighters to decontaminate is a failure of the employers to provide a duty of care to their workforce. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The safety and well-being of firefighters is a priority for both the Scottish Government and the Fire Service. SFRS continued to make progress with its contamination working group, and I was pleased that we were able to recently provide £56,000 contribution to allow Scottish firefighters to be part of the current health screening trials. Question number three, Russell Finlay. Thank you. I ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the transition of HMP Kilmarnock into public ownership. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. President Officer, I saw firsthand when I visited HMP Kilmarnock in August, work on its transition into public ownership and operation is progressing well and on track for handover to the Scottish Prison Service on the 17th of March next year. The Scottish Prison Service has been working closely with Kilmarnock Prison Services Limited and CERCO, the private operator, to deliver a smooth transition in a way that not only supports staff and those in custody, but maintains the high standards already set within the prison. Russell Finlay. Yeah, thank you. I also visited the prison last week and asked the staff if they backed the transfer. None did. I asked if they knew why it was happening. None of them did. I asked if they knew how it would happen. None of them did. Hamza Yusuf is transferring HMP Kilmarnock for blindly ideological reasons. He doesn't actually care that it's an effective, efficient and well-run prison. The SNP, SNP transfer will even result in staff losing the protection of body-worn cameras which will be sent to English prisons. Will the Cabinet Secretary reverse this dangerous decision and commit to providing cameras to all prison officers across Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the contract with CERCO was due to come to an end and this government has uh, always believed that our prisons should be owned and operated within the public sector. <laughs> and, that, and that that, Presiding Officer, is in the interest of public safety and not private profit. And when you look at the, the, the facts of the matter in terms of information, there is a, a lower level of assaults within the Scottish Prison Service in comparison to our private prisons. And there is a lower uh, level per population of drug take incidents within the public sector as well. Matters that I thought that Mr Finlay would take seriously. 
I can also give him reassurance on the body-worn cameras that the Scottish Prison Service is finalising its arrangements uh, for a pilot in collaboration uh, with our trade union partners and that the cameras currently within HMP Kilmarnock uh, belong uh, to CERCO and not the Scottish Prison Service. So let me assure him that efforts are being made and will be made to take forward the important factor around body-worn cameras. Willie Coffey. Thank you very much, President Officer. Mr Findlay's comments are completely at odds with what I hear from the project director and the staff at Kilmarnock Prison over many years. Yeah. Can the Minister confirm that arrangements for troopy transfer for all the staff and prison officers is well underway and that there will be an overall beneficial impact when they transfer to the SPS? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, the, the transfer will take place following the well-established 2 pay process, the regulations uh, that have existed since 2006. Uh, the Scottish Prison Service has uh, written to CERCO uh, to inform staff groups on the measures that will be taken. Uh, there are plans um, developed in partnership with uh, recognised trade unions and the Scottish Prison Service is actively planning one-to-one -one, uh, meetings. And it's also important to recognise that the Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison Service has chaired four engagement sessions to date. We move to question four, and let's keep our questions and responses concise, please. And I call Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its national transitions to adulthood strategy following its statement of intent on the 28th of September. Minister Natalie Don. We will introduce Scotland's first national transitions to adulthood strategy in this parliamentary term to ensure all disabled young people can experience a supported and positive transition to adult life. We are currently engaging with more young people, parent carers and others with a role or interest in transitions to seek feedback on that statement of intent. Following this phase of engagement, we will analyse and publish a summary of the responses to show what people have said. and This will then be used to develop the strategy going forward. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the Minister for that answer, but this Government mentioned a strategy on transitions as far back as 2016 in the manifesto. That's seven years ago and there's still no strategy. A young person who entered high school then will have left by now. They've not seen a strategy and their chances have been affected as a result. The Government know transitions isn't working. So can I ask the Minister, what date will her Government publish a national transition strategy and will it include a legal right to a plan that gives all young disabled people a fighting chance for their future? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. As I've said in my previous answer, we're currently seeking feedback on the statement of intent through the online questionnaire, through a, a whole host of engagement events, including the Glasgow Disability Alliance's transitions event for young people, the Scottish Youth Parliament and the forthcoming Carers Parliament. And this is an important step to sense check what we've heard so far. We want to get this right. Findings from this phase of engagement will be used to develop the strategy going forward, which we will aim to consult on more widely in spring 2024. Thank you. Question number five has been withdrawn for reasons that are apparent, and we move to question number six, and I call Christine Graham. And thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what data it has on rates of winter admissions to accident and emergency as a result of winter falls since October 2020. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, Public Health Scotland published quarterly data on emergency hospital admissions resulting from a fall. When looking at the total fall admissions across the two winter quarters ending December and March, there has been a slight downward trend, with the highest number seen in the winter of 2020-2021 uh, of being 18,508, and the lowest number uh, in winter of 2022-23 of 17,892. Christine Graham. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for a detailed answer. Uh, can I can advise the Cabinet Secretary that both Midlothian Council and Scottish Borders Council in my constituency have information on their website as to where salt bins are located, which is good. However, would the, the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the more that can be done by simply increasing the number of salt bins for clearing winter pavements, the likelihood is even fewer falls and less pressure on already hard-pressed accident and emergency? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, President Officer, I would certainly want to encourage councils across the country, and I know they do, uh, to take action when uh, there is adverse weather that can result in uh, slippery pavements, which can have an awkward effect to uh, demand on our A&E departments. Uh, I know that local authorities uh, will uh, consider applications from local communities who are looking for salt bins to be located within their respective areas. It's something I've undertaken on behalf of constituents within my own constituency, and I'd certainly want to encourage the member to do so on behalf of her constituents where they feel that would be appropriate. Question number seven, Mark Ruskell. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what support is available to residents who have been required to evacuate their properties due to deteriorating reinforced autoclaved aerated concrete. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. Where residents are evacuated from their homes under local authority dangerous building powers, it is for the local authority themselves to determine what support is available to the individuals affected. For Mark Ruskell's constituents who have been decanted in Tillicutri, this has involved providing temporary housing as well as support and advice to find alternative accommodation while detailed investigations take place. My thoughts are, of course, with the families who are currently in these circumstances and the impact on those households has been significant, but I know that Clip Manager Council is working hard to minimise disruption while keeping people safe. Mark Ruskell. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response and obviously her awareness of the situation in Tillicultry. Um, I also understand though that the Council there suspected that over 100 other residences in the same area could also be seriously affected. Um, so can I ask about what that engagement with Clark Manager Council and the Scottish Government has looked like? Has, has there been correspondence about the dire situation that some residents are in at the moment? And how is the Scottish Government preventing affected residents across Scotland from remaining in temporary accommodation indefinitely while they await the outcome of building assessments and potential remedial works? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Government is in contact with um, all councils on this issue and with the Scottish Housing Regulator. Um, and they have been with the, the um, example of Tillicutri right from uh, when this was first identified. My understanding is that 29 households across three housing blocks have been affected and the local authority is conducting further survey work to determine next steps, but has not identified other blocks with unsafe rack. And I think this is an important point for reassurance providing presiding off officer that the Institution of Structural Engineers note that statements of, for example, a 30-year lifespan for RAC are misleading. There is no specific data supporting this. The Institute note that if manufactured and installed correctly and appropriately maintained, RAC should perform comparably with similar materials. But they also, of course, stress the importance of inspecting RAC installations to determine the condition, which is very much my understanding of what the Council is doing. Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, President Officer. A Freedom of Information request I put into Edinburgh City Council identified two developments uh, comprising of 43 homes which contain RAC. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary tell Parliament, do ministers actually now know how many social rented properties and private properties across Scotland could now be containing RAC in this country? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I highlighted in my original answer, uh, this is a, an issue for the Council's concern, but we are working with the Scottish Housing Regulator to undertake a data-gathering exercise in the presence of RAC across all social housing providers. The initial responses were that, uh, for that request uh, were due for the 31st of October and are now being um, collated. And it is very important to ensure that the Scottish Government continues, as it is already, to work with local councils to support communities where affected. Question number eight, Alec Crowley. A presiding officer to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what action it can take in response to the reported rise of violence and bullying in schools. Cabinet Secretary Jenny Gilruth. Uh, in June, I convened the first meeting of the Head Teacher Task Force focused on school exclusions. In September and October, I hosted two events as part of the Scottish Government's Summit on Relationships and Behaviour in Schools. A third event will take place later this month to discuss the behaviour in Scottish schools research. This research will provide the robust national picture of what is happening in our schools across the country on a wide range of behaviours. And my aim from the summit process is to work with teachers and other stakeholders to identify practical actions we need to take to make progress. Finally, we have started a review of our national anti-bullying guidance, Respect for All. The outputs from the summit and behaviour research will all inform this work. Alec Crowley. I thank the Minister for that answer, the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I think it is important to work with teachers, to work with pupils, to work with schools, but the fact is that we're not going to build a world-class education while so many pupils are, are uh, worried in schools. We need to put discipline and behaviour back on the top of the agenda as a condition for being in school. 
Or is, is the Cabinet Secretary going to bring forward a detailed proposal that sets out the types of resources and the plan that we're going to do to address this problem, which is affecting schools up and down Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. I thank Mr Riley for his question. I very much uh, recognise his interest and I agree with him that we need to work with the profession in relation to how we can support them to best respond to some of these challenges. He talked about behaviour and discipline. I'm very conscious that we have a cohort of young people moving through our education system who have experienced disruption to their education whether that be from industrial action or from COVID impacts. And we need to be mindful that all of that is playing into change behaviour and relationships in our schools. That being said, the member raises an important point. There is already national guidance in relation to what we provide as a Scottish Government. The uh, national policy that already exists is the included, engaged and involved policy document. However, I've made very clear that my intention through the summit process is that we look to gather the national evidence from those working on the front line. So yes, our teachers, but those of course who work as learning support assistants too, who play a hugely important role in relation to our schools. We use the findings from the summit process and the BISA research, which gives us the national picture, to help inform that national action plan. And subject to the agreement of Parliament, I would intend, presiding officer, to bring forward a statement later this year to that end. Thank you. That concludes general questions.